The title of this uh, discussion is Who Will Care For Us? And I think it's an appropriate discussion given where we are in our country today. The world uh, itself, but especially the United States, is changing demographically. We're getting older. Uh, we're certainly population-wise getting larger, uh, maybe personally as well, but certainly by population. Uh, and we're much more diverse. And I think the strain of that trifecta it will have enormous impact on health as we go forward and really cause us to reconsider almost every aspect of healthcare, from the way we pay our clinicians to the way we educate them to the way 21st century Americans access healthcare as they go forward. I think it's fair to say that the traditional patient-doctor relationship is, is migrating towards a team-based approach and the impact of that I think is is uncertain right now uh, as, as to both quality as well as satisfaction. Uh, we know that technology is gonna play a far bigger role as we look to the future. Technology is already affecting transparency and it's affecting um, data management in, a, in, a, in an extraordinary way. Uh, electronic health records and new concepts in telemedicine are all part of this revolution we're seeing as a result of technological change. And the workplace is actually becoming a lot more uh, health conscious. Uh, we're putting greater emphasis on wellness in the workplace. And uh, not only that, I think as we, as we uh, begin to shift from defined benefit to defined contribution approaches, uh, that and other things have generated a greater patient engagement with their health in the workplace and, uh, and with insurance. So as we consider all of these enormous changes and its implications for us. The question is, can we come up with ways with which to, to bring about change in a measured way rather than dealing with stopgap approaches that may or may not be in our best interest? And, and how do we ensure that the confidence level of all consumers of health in our country uh, remains high and that we can deal with the quality and the, and the, and the cost implications of all this in a meaningful way? Uh, I've always argued we really don't have a health system in our country. We have a, we have a, a, a marketplace made up of a collage of subsystems, both public and private. And therein lies some of our strength and some of our weakness with regard to health. Uh, and that collage really has to be integrated in a more effective way. And that will affect the care and the quality that we, uh, we are all challenged to produce. So we couldn't have three more qualified people uh, to discuss this issue, and I'm really flattered and, and appreciative of uh, my opportunity to, to uh, spend the next hour with them. Agent Pu is the director of the National Democratic Workers Alliance and the co-director of Caring, Access, or, or Caring Across Generations. She co-founded the Domestic Workers United and organized the first National Domestic Workers Convention. Daryl Kirsch, on the other end of uh, the dais here, is the president and CEO of the Association of, Me of American Medical Colleges. Prior to leading the association, he was dean and academic health systems leader of Medical College of Georgia and Penn State's Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. And in the middle, Diane Meyer, the director of the Center to Advance Palliative Care, a national organization devoted to increasing the number and quality of palliative care providers in the United States. So let me start just by asking all three of our participants, as the demographics of care change, and as we consider these challenges going forward, what are some of the most catalytic factors that will determine whether or not we succeed? And what should we be focused on as we try to prioritize those factors today? Hey, Jen? Sure, well, good afternoon. It's really wonderful to be with all of you and an honor to be on this panel. Um, at Caring Across Generations, we are a new movement that has come together to inspire people to value connections across generations in light of the changing demographics in this country and the fact that we're about to have the largest older population we've ever had, 10,000 people per day, 4 million per year turning 65. Um, some people call it the silver tsunami. Um, but we, we actually see it as a huge opportunity. Um, and it's an opportunity to really strengthen our values and our relationships, to really value caregiving in a different way, 
but most people experience it as, as a crisis of some sort, right, where um, they are, have a loved one or a family member who needs care and they can't afford it or they don't know where to find it or they can't find the right caregiver. There's all kinds of challenges that people face because there are increased needs for care as people live longer and, and more and more people want to stay in their homes and in their communities as they age. Nine out of 10 Americans actually want to stay in their homes and communities as they age and be a part of all of the changes that come with us being able to live longer, work longer, create longer, Longer, um, and connect longer. And so what Caring Across Generations is really trying to do is come together to advocate for solutions that strengthen people's choices for home and community-based care and increase the quality, raise the quality and standards of that care, as well as strengthen the workforce that we're going to need to be able to provide that care and support the growing needs in the community. And it, that's going to be so key. I mean, the home care workforce right now is um, the fastest growing occupation in the country because of the demand. And right now, most of the workers work at a poverty wage, earn minimum wage. It's not, there's no benefits. People are burning out left and right. It's simply not sustainable. So what we're trying to figure out is, can we come up with a way to invest in home and community-based care solutions that both strengthen and uplift the workforce and strengthen families and options for families and individuals, consumers? And in so doing, create new efficiencies in the healthcare delivery system, create new ways of managing chronic illnesses and connecting the dots across different pieces of the healthcare system in new ways. And so we think that an investment in homes and an investment in this care that we can receive in the homes and in the workplace can be a huge game-changing opportunity for us. Thank you, Agent. Diane? Yeah. Um, so the Center to Advance Palliative Care tries to improve access to palliative care, and I bet a lot of you are not quite sure what palliative care is. Um, palliative care is a new team specialty that focuses on maximizing quality of life for people living with a serious illness, whether it's frailty or dementia or cancer or heart failure, and their families. Um, it is not limited to end-of-life care. And so I'd like to tell you a story about somebody who got just the kind of care that was described um, and how palliative care allowed that to happen. This was an 88-year-old, moderately demented person that I met in Mount Sinai's emergency department two years ago when I was on the palliative care consult service. And the attending in the emergency room called me down and said, you know, can you guys come down here and help us? This couple has been in the emergency room. This is the fourth time in two months. I'm not sure this is an appropriate palliative care consult, but we just don't know what to do. So we go down there. Mr. B, I'll call him, 88, moderate dementia, but his real problem is very severe arthritis and low back pain. So that getting up off the toilet, getting out of a chair is extremely challenging for him. And he frequently falls trying to do that. The only person who cares for him is his 85-year-old wife, who herself has hand arthritis and her own medical problems. So this time he fell getting off the toilet at 7 p.m. on a Thursday night. And they called their doctor. right? And what do you think they got when they called the doctor? What do you think it said? If this is a medical emergency, hang up now and call 911. Now, there is no doorman in their building. They live in Yorktown on 92nd and York um, on the Upper East Side, and their only daughter lives here, actually, in Colorado. Um, so they came to the ED. This was the fourth ED visit in two months. We came down, and he was furious that his wife had brought him back again. He had been hospitalized three times in the prior two months. And she said, what else could I do? There was nothing else I could do. So what we did was connect him to what we a wonderful house calls program we have at Mount Sinai called Visiting Doctors, where doctors, nurses, social workers see people at home. And it, they basically provide palliative care to people who are going to live for a long time, like Mr. B. 
We also got Meals on Wheels in there to reduce the caregiver burden on Mrs. B, so she had less shopping, cooking, and cleaning to do. And we arranged for a friendly visitor program. And this was through their local church and high school students doing community service. Three times a week, they come in after school for three hours and hang out with Mr. B. They watch the game, they read, and they give Mrs. B an urgently needed break. So that was two years ago. Mr. B is now 90. Mrs. B is now 87. They are still living at home independently. He has not once been back to the ED or the hospital. That's what palliative care can do. And I think the important thing to understand is that without that kind of ability to, to incorporate both the medical support, the pain management, the constipation management, the fall risk reduction, and the social support, the meals, the human support from the community, none of this would have worked. So it's both social and medical needs, both addressed at the same time and coordinated at the same time. That has enabled this couple to remain at home independently. Now let me ask you, is this better quality care? It, is it cheaper? Okay. Why is it cheaper? It's cheaper because the quality is better. If the quality was not better, if we did not meet their needs, she would have no alternative but to call 911, right? So it is only by improving quality that we reduce cost. You can't cheat. So what's the key issue? 24-7 phone contact. If she calls some, some at 6 p.m., a human being who has access to his electronic health record calls back within 30 minutes. So they can get someone to the house. They work with the local visiting nurse service of New York. They work with the local hospice when and if he becomes eligible, which he is not right now. Um, so they pull in additional community resources. And he doesn't need a home health aid at this point. Um, he probably will. Um, and will need well-trained, well-compensated, skilled workers mm -hmm. to help the two of them remain in the community. So that's just an example. That's the patient population. It's not people on the brink of death. We have hospice for those people. It's the people who are not on the brink of death, but have chronic, very long-term, but very debilitating in terms of quality of life, functional impairment, cognitive impairment, frailty, huge caregiver burden. And it's the caregivers that are calling 911, I might add. It is the caregivers who are desperate for help. They are the ones precipitating all this utilization. So if we don't pay attention to the caregivers, nothing we do will be effective. That's the population we need to really markedly shift how we target and serve. And we're not doing either of those right now very well. Thank you very much, Diane. Daryl? You know, <clears throat> being somebody who is riding the crest of the silver tsunami, <laughs> um, it, it's interesting how uh, with each day this question feels more real to me. <laughs> who will care for us? And I think what's already been mentioned is the answer to the question really lies in a fundamental culture change in healthcare. Um, the healthcare educational system that we came up in uh, was very focused on training very capable individuals. And the culture that was created around healthcare was very individualistic. And I'm sure there are people in this room who experience it in the form of having a great collection of specialists who don't talk to each other very well, um, and nobody really pulling it together as a true team. So the phrase that's always used is that we've, we've acted like healthcare was an individual sport, and the culture change is that we're realizing it has to be a team activity to get things done. And, you know, Diane's example is, is a wonderful, elegant example of a team, creating a team that wrapped around a family and a patient in need uh, and really got the job done. But uh, speaking from the perspective of, of the institutions that educate the providers of the future, we are finally really embracing this. You know, um, when I was a medical student, you were trained with your other fellow medical students, and then you were thrown into a clinic or a hospital, and somebody said, now be a team. 
but you had not been prepared for those relationships. In many cases, you didn't really understand the roles uh, of the other people uh, you were working beside. Now there is a huge movement among the academic health centers in the U.S. to do very purposeful interprofessional educational activities. In many cases, starting from day one, bringing nurses, pharmacists, medical students together and helping them understand their roles. I mean, ultimately, it would be great to extend it to those people who are not the degreed health professionals, but still doing a lot of the clinical care. Um, just the last point I'll make about that is there's that old saying that folly is hoping for A while rewarding B. <laughs> and we still have payment systems in this country that don't tend to reward teams. <laughs> they tend to reward individuals. So we're educating and coming together very, very collaboratively with the other educational associations. But when you get out into the care settings, there's still way too much going on in the way of turf battles. You know, rather than acting like teams, too much of providers saying, this is my territory, you stay on your turf. But the culture is changing, and I'm really pleased that, that we're starting to drive it at the educational level. And I think the nurses, pharmacists, dentists, all of the health professionals graduating now have a much higher expectation of this. Darrell, let me just follow up a little bit on, on that. As I travel the country, I think it's conventional wisdom that we're attempting to migrate from an illness to a wellness system with greater emphasis on wellness and good prevention. And it is, you're absolutely right, uh, a big part of the challenge is to follow the money. And the, when you follow the money, we, we tend to pay subspecialties at a much higher level than we do any place else. And it is a little bit of a chicken and egg, I guess, in the educational framework. Are we able to move that paradigm and, and create more of a, a wellness and primary care approach to health? Uh, or do we have to wait until we follow the money where we reward primary care uh, more significantly before we can expect to see education change? Well, I don't think it uh, has to be sequential. I think it has to happen in parallel. And in fact, there are a number of health system leaders in the room. And what they're doing at the same time as they're, they're moving towards more interprofessional models of education is they're trying to build more team-based models within their health system. And they're getting more and more interested in seeking payment systems that are not the traditional fee for service. You know, do more, rescue people, and we'll pay you but are more population-based models. You do a good job taking care of this population, and this is the amount we'll, you'll be paid. Employers are demanding that. I think we'll see Medicare and Medicaid increasingly move to that kind of payment. Um, I think most people view it as inevitable. We're just not sure when we'll get to that model. But, it, but right now, we can't afford to wait for it. We have to be changing the education. And I know a lot of the health systems are seizing every opportunity they have to try out these population-based payment models. Diana, let me come back to something you said when you, in your opening comments, and that is that there's a, people really aren't fully appreciative of what palliative care can do, and, and, and it's, it's increasing profile as we look at, at, uh, at uh, that aspect of care delivery in our country. I've got a few scars from getting involved with the debates about end of life. And, um, and it still remains somewhat of an untouchable as we talk about public policy. Right. Uh, but palliative care seems to me to be such a significant opportunity to contribute to that whole discussion along with hospice. Could you, could you drill down a little bit more on, on how we look at that and, and, and how we might finally take that whole notion of end of life off the table as an untouchable and look at it realistically and, and in a much more mature way than we have re in recent years? Thank you for that question. Um, so hospice became a federal benefit about 27 years ago in the 80s. And in an attempt, a legitimate attempt by policymakers to control the costs of what is a very sophisticated team-based model of care delivered in the home. They thought there would be a huge woodwork effect, that everyone would want this, unless they put pretty restrictive limits on access. So the restrictive limits were very effective. 
So first, two doctors have to say you're going to be dead within six months. We have no idea who's going to be dead in six months. This is a problem that having policymakers do things without legitimate medical input. We don't know. Mr. B could have died a month after I met him, but here he is two years later. Would I be surprised if he had died? No, but I can't predict with accuracy. And had I referred him to hospice, that hospice could have been accused of fraud and abuse for taking care of someone who failed to die on time. And most of the people, only 23% of us die of cancer. Many people don't realize that. 77% of us die of things like Mr. B has without a predictable prognosis. So we don't know when he's going to die. He still needs palliative care because he needs it, not because he's dying. So that's one problem. The second problem with hospice to, that, made, that policymakers did to try to keep people out of it was force people to sign a piece of paper saying they agree to give up Medicare coverage for disease treatment. Now, if you wanted to do something cruel to vulnerable patients, that's what you would do. Force them to choose between treatment for their disease and treatment focused on quality of life. It's awful. And I've had counseled many hundreds, thousands of patients and families about this hospice decision. And that's the most painful part. And they literally have to sign away their right to regular insurance coverage. So not surprisingly, many people refuse to sign because they want continued life-prolonging treatment. And in many cases, it's appropriate that they get continued life-prolonging treatment. They're benefiting from it. Um, so it's a, it's a policy that got deformed, as they often do. And the result is that while 40% or so of Medicare beneficiaries do get hospice at some point during their life, 30% of hospice beneficiaries get it for less than a week. 10% for less than 24 hours, and the median length of stay is 18 days. So Mr. B, here he is, two years of palliative care need, not dying, not hospice eligible. What about that gap? Okay. So all Medicare pays for in that space, that non-dying space, is the certified home health agency, which is Medicare reimbursed, but also has Herculean restrictions on it. So in order to get Medicare-funded home care, you have to be homebound. Mr. B is not homebound. He goes out. He still walks. He's not homebound. And you have to have, quote, a skilled need. So if you just need what he needs, which is Meals on Wheels and friendly visitors and some a visiting medical team, he's not eligible. Plus, they were switched to a DRG episode-based, reimbursement-based. So certified home health agencies are now financially incented to discharge people as quickly as possible. So they do not fill the gap either. So that's what we've got in the community, and this huge gap between what hospice can do, which is largely brink of death care or the last few months, and certified home health agencies can do, which is episode. You need a wound, we can help you with that. You need to learn to take insulin, we can help you with that. But forget about your exhausted family caregiver, forget about your long-term pain management needs, forget about what you need at three in the morning. That's, that is the gap that the new field of palliative care developed in response to. And I have to say, um, and Daryl should be very proud of this, that the development of the field really began in academic medical centers in the United States and has spread from academic medical centers as leaders to the rest of the nation. Um, so I think palliative care is an exemplar of the innovation that comes out of academic medical centers and then begins to have a much broader impact. Um, this confusion between palliative care and hospice care is very dangerous, though, because the result is that people don't get access to this kind of care until, really, they it's too late. Um, and the reason that's very unfortunate is not only does it markedly improve patient and family quality of life, there are now about six different studies showing that palliative care prolongs life compared to usual care. So think about Mr. B. Do you think that palliative care prolonged his life? I do. I mean, with each hospitalization, he got more deconditioned, more confused, more incontinent, because he was, had bed rails up in the hospital. Hospitals are dangerous for people like Mr. B. So there are good science saying, if you get palliative care plus regular medical care, 
say you have cancer and you get palliative care with your oncology care, you live longer. So not only is it better quality of life, not only is it much cheaper because it's better quality, you also live longer. So why isn't everyone demanding this? Because of the confusion with hospice. And correcting that is so important. Um, so I really appreciate having that opportunity. Um, well, thank you. I love your passion. <laughs> I, I, we've, each of us have talked about expanded scope of practice and the potential that it offers. And I, I think it's still evolving. And as I said in my comments earlier, I, I, I don't know that we necessarily know for sure that it's going to be improved satisfaction and outcomes, but I think intuitively it would seem that that's a possibility. But let me ask Ai-jin, as we look at the role domestic workers continue to play, um, obviously as, as we move outside of the institutions of health that we've known them, hospitals especially, and, and look more to home health, what are gonna be the key factors in determining whether domestic workers are able to fulfill their responsibilities and play a more important role? Well, I'll tell you how I got even interested into this whole conversation to begin with is you know, for almost 20 years, I've been working with a constituency of housekeepers mostly and nannies and caregivers for the elderly in the private pay gray market, meaning people who are just kind of hiring through word of mouth. Um, somebody to come and check in on Aunt Joan. Or, and um, what we found in the last few years is that more and more housekeepers and nannies are being asked by the families that they work for to also provide care supports and services for their aging loved ones. And so many of them felt like in order to do their jobs well, they needed more training. And so they started to come to us and say, we want training in how to identify chronic illnesses and pain management and wound care and lifting and all these supports for activities of daily living that they were being called upon to do. And so we started to ask around about what kind of training was available and we found that it's very inconsistent, right? That the quality of the training that exists for the sort of lower end of home health, home health work, whether it's personal care aid or home care aids, that um, it's a little bit all over the map and it certainly does not extend down to domestic workers who maybe primarily have experience doing housekeeping but are now suddenly being called upon to do more. And so I say this to say that um, the work is already being done in so many different ways because there's so many gaps. And we can actually start to look at, um, somebody said last night, the future is now, it's just unevenly distributed and a little bit disorganized, or maybe a lot disorganized. Um, and so to actually look at what's working, that the solutions that families are coming up with now, looking at what's working and how to really strengthen it for all parties. And so we think an investment in training and workforce development, where we are actually creating some really strong standards for training for personal care aides and home care aides, and then extending that career ladder, that training, one layer down to people with limited English speaking capacity or limited literacy and just GED education levels, and really trying to kind of democratize the career ladder for healthcare to really reach this incredibly talented, untapped resource of women workers who are already out there supporting millions of families. Can I just add something Absolutely. to that? That is that we tend to see that grassroots layer of support, that bottom of the pyramid layer of support as kind of extra or marginal. But in fact, that is the group that actually meets the needs of this patient population. Doctors cannot provide personal care. Nurses cannot provide personal care. They can come in at most for an hour, and then they leave. And then the whole thing rests on the family caregiver. The real needs of people who want to stay home and independent in their community are these needs. But we haven't paid any attention to it, in large part because we don't want to pay for it from a policy standpoint. Um, but that's penny wise and pound foolish, because by not meeting these needs effectively and with high quality, we lead people to 911 calls. And our workforce can be a really important part of the solution here, right? A really important part of the care team, working closely with families, 
doctors, nurses, everyone involved. And some of these technological tools that are becoming available to support this teamwork, this workforce can be trained to use those tools. My whole membership is on Facebook, I'll tell you right now. And a lot of them have families in Nepal and the Philippines, and they Skype. And so they can actually help the client base, the families, the consumers be connected. They can help with um, sharing information and communication. They just need to be in the loop, and they need to have the support and really be valued as part of the care team. Daryl? It would seem that this is a... Uh great opportunity for web-based educational modules mm -hmm. and that if the health professions, nursing in particular, I think could um, <clears throat> help terrifically with issues like just safety, lifting, preventing falls, Absolutely. a lot of the basics, nutrition and other items and um, if there are any foundations in the audience. <laughs> It would, you know, it would be a very cost-effective way to create some training modules that then could be widely available me, to your alumni. Uh, agent's uh, comments just now triggered a, a thought that I, 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 I've grappled with for a long, long time, and that is that this trend that we've seen in our country, where over a quarter now of care is offered by foreign medical graduates or foreign-born caregivers, and I, I grapple with it because on one hand, it's great that, uh, that the best and the brightest are coming to the United States to provide the care that we benefit from. On the other hand, the best and the brightest are not in their own countries offering care in those settings where it may be needed arguably even more than here. How should we look at that? And should we have policies that encourage it or discourage it? How, uh, what, what in your view is the ultimate impact and how should we look at that? Hey, Jen? Um, well, I think that Given the needs in this country, there's many places where we actually do have labor shortages and workforce shortages. And we also have a jobs crisis in this country where we do need to create jobs, millions of them. And I think one key piece of this is if enough of these jobs are quality jobs that you can take pride in and support your family on, more Americans will go into them, right? Um, and if these career ladders are really clear, then I think that they will be of interest to more American workers. And we will need workers from abroad as well. And the question is, how do they come and strengthen the health, entire healthcare system that we have here? I think it's a both and. And I think the question is, how do we make sure that the quality is high enough and the supports are there at every level of the workforce such that they are jobs that are um, jobs that American workers also want and can actually enter as well. Daryl? I think we do need to be sensitive to the dangers of a brain drain from some of the most vulnerable parts of the world. I think Dr. Sklar is here and he I think is going to Mozambique um, to work on a program that has tried to pair U.S. medical schools with sub-Saharan African schools in order to help them not just build their physician base, but keep those physicians there. I mean, there was a chilling study published a while back that there are more, more physicians from Malawi were practicing in the United Kingdom than in Malawi. You know, and that really is hitting vulnerable nations um, where it hurts. But, but there, the related issue of uh, under who will care for us is general workforce shortages. I mean, the one uh, that we're very concerned about, and many people wouldn't know this, but there's been now for uh, 17 years an artificially imposed cap on the training of medical residents in this country. And we have the extraordinary um, phenomenon that in the last two years, we've had hundreds, 500 two years ago, 400 this year, US MD graduates who could not get a residency position. So we'd invested all that time and energy in then getting them to the level of, of an MD, but because we've constrained the number of residency training positions, 
back with a, a congressional act that was intended to balance the budget. We are, just when we're going to need more doctors for the boomers, we've artificially capped the supply. One of the things we haven't talked about, and we'll open it up to questions here in a minute uh, from the floor, but we can't, uh, we can't have this discussion without talking about uh, an area that Daryl and I in particular as leaders in the silver tsunami uh, of baby boomers will have to contemplate, and that's long-term care. Uh, before the session began, we had an informal discussion, and we had a recent debacle, of course, with the Class Act demise of, uh, very, uh, very quickly as it was uh, initiated and then repealed. But how do we, how do we look at long-term care? Seven percent of the people in the country today have insurance uh, from the private sector to provide for uh, their care uh, financially. 35% uh, of Medicaid is now dedicated to long-term care, and it's only going to grow. So it is really one of those enormous challenges our country is going to face demographically and financially, and uh, it's not that far off. Uh, so I'd love to get thoughts about how we ought to look at it and uh, how we might begin to have a conversation uh, that would realistically put us on a more positive course for long-term care going forward. Diane? Yeah, so it, it's, it's fascinating because what all of us have talked about is this need to shift the focus of our attention as a society, um, as communities, and as healthcare systems into the community right into where people want to be, which is at home. So you guys may not know that it used to be that in order to get Medicaid funded long-term care, you had to go into a nursing home. You couldn't get Medicaid funded home health aides to come into your home to keep you at home. You had to agree to go into a nursing home. And of course, <coughs> surprise, surprise, that costs a lot. So medic 21 states have this rebalancing effort, they're calling it, Medicaid rebalancing effort, to allow people to stay in their own home with help from hopefully well-trained, adequately compensated and respected uh, personal care support. Um, and guess what? It costs one-third the cost of being in a nursing home. One-third. Okay. Is it better quality? Do people want that? Yes. Our policy is so far behind anything rational and logical, right? So uh, it's much better and cheaper to keep people at home and provide the supports they need to stay at home. Um, and that requires a policy shift. It requires putting some of the both Medicare and Medicaid and Medicare Advantage private insurer money into community supports, and it's not just medical, it's also social supports. In fact, it's probably largely social supports that keep people safe at home, um, that support the caregivers. And so a long-term care policy ought to be about investing in community partnerships, community funding beyond healthcare funding, but other community funding mechanisms. Um, to create the capacity in neighborhoods and communities to care for ourselves and our loved ones. And that's going to require a combination of health care funding and other sources of funding. Um, and a big, it's, it's not so much spending more money, it's putting less money into the acute care system and more money into communities. Now, why isn't that already happening, given that it's so logical? Because a lot of people survive on the current health care system and lobby very intensively, as you know, to keep it from changing. And there is no question that a shift in resources from very costly acute care settings and into the community carries with it enormous economic dislocation and is not going to be easy and is not going to be fast. But that's the direction incrementally that we need to move towards, where people are in hospitals because they really need to be there, not because 911 calls were the only option. And I know you spent a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, I want to get Daryl's comments too, but uh, how do you look at that? I agree more. I, I really agree. And just to build off of that, I think that there are some states where the silver tsunami is hitting first in this country, states like Maine, uh, states like Hawaii, where the aging population is actually really significant. And they've actually they've taken the initiative and lead and are creating 
um, really innovative solutions at the state level to start to address the long-term care needs of their state. And they're also bringing together all the different stakeholders, so seniors, people with disabilities, the workforce, um, women's organizations, family caregiver organizations, Alzheimer's associations, everyone at the table to try to develop solutions that work for everyone. And um, as a result of a process like that, Hawaii is about to be the first state next year where they're going to introduce a long-term care social insurance program at the state level. Um, but there are other states that have other solutions. There are people who are looking at tax credits for people who pay out of pocket for care um, through the private pay market. There's, there's all kinds of ideas that people have for the more social end of the long-term care and home care needs that, that families have in their state. And it's because of that innovation that we're seeing around the country that we feel like, given we're, that we're in this moment where there isn't a clear silver bullet for what needs to happen on long-term care, that we should really invest in the state at level innovation and initiatives that people are already developing and support those and document them, study the data, understand what can be scalable and what should be tried federally um, through, through the practical experience of states. And so we're advocating for the creation of an innovation fund that would really support those initiatives to take place and for all of us to learn from them. And to us, the key really is finding that right balance between what really strengthens the workforce and what really creates more choices for quality care, affordable quality care for families and consumers. RWJ has a great website on this issue, um, on the issue of, of partnerships, community partnerships, and bringing together very diverse sectors, housing, uh, young children, um, young mothers, health, um, and diverse funding sources, not just healthcare funding sources, to address these problems in communities. And there's a whole range of examples on their website that I think are really instructive about this. Address this, and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. I just worry about um, the long-term care challenge being one dimension of potential intergenerational unfairness. If we don't have long-term care uh, available generally, especially to people of lesser means, it's just one more burden that is going to be passed from parents down to children and grandchildren. And, and I think it's, it's one of several areas where we really have to say, are we about to just bequeath our problems? to the next generation rather than take some action now. So well said. We want to open it to the floor, but let me get a, a World Cup update. <laughs> zero, zero. OK, halftime. Great. That's why we're holding our audience. It's halftime. So no need to leave. Uh, questions? Uh, this is terrific. My name is Spence Taylor. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, president of the Greenville Health System Clinical University and also Senior Associate Dean for uh, University of South Carolina School of Medicine Greenville, which is a new one of the 14 or so new and emerging medical schools. Uh, love this session, uh, sing, singing to the choir, really, in our perspective. Uh, simple question for the panel, maybe Diane, maybe Daryl. Um, where does this hit the training paradigm? So one of the real opportunity, you know, charting a new medical school from scratch has many challenges, but it has lots of opportunities. And one of the opportunities is to make up where things important for the future like this hit the training paradigm. Is palliative care a <coughs> mandatory clerkship in the third year? Is it a uh, experience that's weaved, uh, wo wo woven throughout the, uh, a thread that's woven throughout the curriculum? Is it something that hits the fourth year? What's, what's everybody's thought so on that? I did not plant that question, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for it. You go. Um, unfortunately, no, palliative care is not mandatory training. Mount Sinai is one of very few medical schools that requires any palliative care training for undergraduate medical students, and they get one week, and that was a battle. Um, with, the, with the one week, we cannot take them into the home and the nursing home and let them see what the community demands are. They're only seeing hospital-based palliative care, which while important, is by no means the most important setting. We need help get, and the fact is that every teaching hospital, every medical school associated teaching hospital in the United States has a well-integrated palliative care team. They're just not getting access to the learners. So anything we can do 
to encourage slash mandate that exposure will make a huge difference in terms of the next generation's capacity to manage the problems of the silver tsunami. If I could just make a friendly amendment to my <coughs> colleague from uh, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, I think I would rank as being the best in the country at this, but what's been gratifying to me is every year we uh, have a questionnaire for graduating students, and there has been a rapid increase in the number of students who report that they feel they've received effective training, not just in palliative care, end of life issues, but related issues like ethics, uh, like shared decision making. So I think the word is getting out. And I think actually the new schools, like the one you've done in Greenville, have been helpful because when you have a blank slate, nobody's saying, we've done it this way for the last 20 years, why do you want to change it? You can do it right now. Right, I would just add to that that what students say they get has nothing to do with their actual skill and competency. So, um, <laughs> you know, there's the what we call the ignorance arrogance axis in medicine that the less people know, the more they think they know often. Um, if if I, many of my colleagues are and dear friends are oncologists and they believe they're already delivering palliative care to their patients, but they're not. They actually don't know. It's really exciting in the second hour if you want to stay around. <laughs> Let's take another question. Hi, my name is Nancy Dunlap, and I'm from Houston, Texas. And we're talking here about sort of big ideas, and there's this constant assumption that staying at home is the best thing for people as they get older. And there's been very little discussion of what the ramifications of isolation are. And there's an assumption that being in a facility is more expensive. We haven't had much discussion about whether we can make the institutions, quote, less expensive and change the name from institutions to something that doesn't have the same bad memory as um, orphanages or nursing homes or something like that. But I think to the extent that we assume everybody should stay home, we're putting blinders on some of the opportunities. Does anyone have an observation? Well, I, we it just, that's, a, that's such a great question and observation. I, my mother uh, suffers from Alzheimer's, and we were talking before the session started about how she wanted to stay in her home as long as she could, but increasingly she was isolated, she was alone, she, uh, she really had no opportunity to engage, even though she had people who came to the home. She's now in just an incredibly good place uh, in Redmond, Washington, where she's socializing and she's really engaged again and so much more vivacious since than she used to be. So finding the right balance. I think it's, it's I, I was just talking earlier about how we shouldn't look at institutionalization the way we used to, and that's your point. And I think the more we can find the right balance and encourage uh, that socialized environment for people, uh, regardless of their condition, I think we're advantaging the patient and probably making the most sense in health. But let me just turn yeah, over my... There's this movement called, um, that I'm sure you're well aware of, called culture change in the nursing home and assisted living long-term care field. And culture change, culture change means recognizing that this is the person's home and that they are the boss of their own life and their own home. And instead of forcing residents to be bathed at a certain time and to have breakfast at 7 a.m. and lunch at 11.30 and dinner at 5, which they never did when they lived in their own homes, that actually these, these communities, home and communities, should organize themselves around the priorities of the resident. And that's a long process, but it's well underway. And we went from 10 or 20 percent of nursing homes in a survey saying they were starting to integrate these processes five years ago to more like 70 or 80 percent in a very short period of time. So the example is if the person doesn't want to eat dinner at 5 o'clock and they want to eat at midnight, that's fine. And if a person gets agitated and is vocalizing and is pushing away help, instead of dosing people with antipsychotics and restraining them, assuming that this might be pain that the person can't articulate anymore because of their cognitive impairment, and first trying to treat for pain 
instead of assuming this is just you know, psychotic behavior and treating it that way. And the places that are doing this and are doing it in a well-integrated way are wonderful places that I would rather be in than my own home um, when I reach, as I hopefully will get old enough to reach the need for that. Um, and I think our, the baby boom generation is pushing really hard to make that a reality for our own future. When I reach that point, I want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let's take Me another too. question. Um, so I was a caregiver for seven, oh, Wanda Mobius. Um, so I was a caregiver for seven years, and it happened overnight. And we had no place to turn for assistance or find out what benefits we had. Through a church bulletin board, we found a culturally re relevant um, home health aide, and she stayed with us for seven years, Monday through Friday, from five in the morning till three in the afternoon. But what I don't feel very guilty about is that she was working in the gray market. And so that's seven years that she's, not, she's an American citizen, but she's, she has no Medicare, like, towards her quarters. And what's being done to change that? Very yeah. Important yeah. Um, well, we are really committed to professionalizing this workforce and bringing the entire workforce out of the shadows. Um, and I think that training helps to do that. It, there's a culture change piece to it. There's a policy change piece to it. Um, a lot of workers prefer to stay in the gray market because the wages are so low that it's not economically viable for them to pay taxes and do all the things that they need to do in order to be. And then there's many who are undocumented immigrants who, you know, frankly, have to stay under the radar. And that's why immigration reform was a really important piece of this larger conversation about the future of the, this workforce and health care. And, um, so there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, but I think that there's more and more awareness, especially because there's millions of families who have your same experience of wanting a better future for this incredibly important workforce. And so we're starting to have the conversation about what are the many things we need to do to bring it out of the shadows. So. We have three minutes and three questions. Uh, still, why don't we take each of the questions together and then we will answer them collectively. But uh, let's start great. with you. Real quick, it might be a follow-up to that one, which I thought was a great question. Agent, what you're doing is terrific. Um, is there a free market connection? Uh, no one's really talking about that. But if the number of jobs is growing, that's, there's, there might be some. I don't know if you've given that any thought. So second question. Sure. Uh, I was actually happy to hear assisted living um, finally mentioned because that's the industry that I work closely with. So two quick questions. Uh, Diane, as part of your palliative care efforts, you talked about Meals on Wheels and some of those other things that truly come to the home. Do you think about assisted living as part of that effort? And then for iGen, all, all of your workforce, when you talk about career paths, you know, are people thinking about assisted living as part of that path? Hi, I'm Caitlin Reiki. I work for Athena Health, and we're a data services company. So my question is, what do you see as the role for the electronic health record in enabling information sharing uh, and collaboration between care teams? And second part of the question is, how do we encourage providers and primary caregivers to think about um, these palliative caregivers and home care workers as part of the care team and actually welcome the information that's generated by those providers? Terrific questions. Let me just go down down the panel. And Agent, let me start with you, then Diane and Daryl. Sure. So um, we are actually developing a social enterprise care matching service to match trained um, quality care providers with families who want to do the right thing and bring workers out of the shadows and into the light. And um, we're actually in beta testing right now. Um, so we're doing some pilots, and um, very soon we'll be up and running, and hope that you will all um, check us out. Care Tango is what Care it's Tango. called. Cool. Um, and we're also working, there's a, there's a lot of online marketplaces that have popped up um, to really provide this service. And it's a reflection of just the huge growth in the private pay care marketplace. So companies like Care.com, 
um, Home Joy, Home Hero. There's a lot of co companies, Sitter City, a lot of them are childcare based at the moment, but um, there are many that do pieces of what are what is needed. And I think the important thing for the consumers to say is that we actually want the jobs to be good jobs. We want these uh, the workforce to be one that's sustainable and strong for the 21st century. And so that we're sort of at this crossroads where this market is coming into being. Like, let's make sure that as it does so, that the quality of these jobs are really good. Um, yeah, quality jobs, quality care. Um, and standardization and regulation, urgently needed. Um, so I'll leave that. On the assisted living, as people may not know, the number of people in nursing homes is shrinking as the number of people in assisted living is enlarging. What people don't realize is that <coughs> assisted living facilities, while they are somewhat regulated, are a lot less regulated than nursing homes and have a lot less professional staff than nursing homes. So they make use of the community entities like hospice, like certified home health agencies to come in and help their residents just as if they lived at home. They may have a RN during daytime hours who may help with things like vital signs and administering medications. But um, after hours, they don't have skilled medical staff for the most part. Um, so it's a critically important group because they are mostly not hospice eligible. They are mostly not dying. They are mostly like Mr. B and need uh, long-term palliative care. And so the way to do that is both by training the workers in the assisted living facility and creating community capacity to visit and step in when, for example, there's a pain crisis and can come in and adjust the medications and talk about side effects and check back in 24 hours later. You're not gonna have that capacity in the assisted living facility, but you should have a connection of the assisted living facility to that community capacity um, where it's really important. And the last question was, well, yeah, the, without an interoperative electronic health record, none of this is ever gonna work. Um, unless the people, taking care of the same person, it's the same human being, getting care from six different doctors, a, a certified home health aide, in an assisted living facility, using one or more hospitals, unless they are all looking at a single source of truth. All this talk about coordination and alignment is a pipe dream. And we're not there yet, but we really need the infrastructure investment so that everyone's using interoperable electronic health records and using, right now I know I can't get that information. I use the telephone and email to find out what's going on with my patients in all the other places. It's incredibly inefficient. Um, and most people don't have time to do that. Daryl, you get the final word. The technology will help with the issue you raise, <clears throat> but this also is a cultural change mm -hmm. and um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, how you deal with your patient's suffering, um, you're not prepared for that by taking organic chemistry or physics. <laughs> uh, so we really feel that we have to start at the very beginning. And there is a shift in emphasis in medical schools now to really look for applicants who have a broader knowledge in the social sciences, the behavioral sciences, the humanities. Uh, and really encourage them to pursue those careers because in my experience, a lot of this boils down to communication skills. And what's interesting is when we survey people now, people like you, uh, we get very high marks for our medical school graduates, 96, 97 percent approval of their medical knowledge, confidence. When you ask uh, the question, how confident are you in their bedside manner? it falls significantly. And I think bedside manner is really boils down to that communication, empathy, and attention to suffering that you were able to respond to with Mr. B. Well, this conversation could easily go another hour, but we are out of time, and someone else will be occupying this space shortly. Join me in thanking our three panelists for the job. Excellent. <laughs>